just going to give it a minute, let a couple more people trickle in here. Great. Hello to everyone joining us. Thank you all for joining us this evening for the celebration of Violet Cooper Smith's new novel, Build a House Around My Body, or Build Your House Around My Body, <laughs> uh, with Rachel Kong from The Ruby. I'm Erica from Green Apple Books. And just before we get into the reading, I'd like to let you all know about a few upcoming events. This Wednesday, the 14th, we are celebrating the release of the letters of Shirley Jackson alongside her son and editor of the collection, Lawrence Jackson Hyman, and scholar Bernice Murphy. And then on next Monday, the 19th, you can tune in to see Sam Keen discuss his new book, The Ice Pick Surgeon with Mary Roach. And throughout our reading tonight, please feel free to leave comments in the chat box and questions in the Q&A box. You should see both at the bottom of your screen. And at the end of the hour, Rachel and Violet will be happy to answer them. Rachel Kong is a writer living in San Francisco. Her debut novel, Goodbye Vitamin, won the 2017 California Book Award for First Fiction and was a Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist um, for First Fiction as well. <laughs> From 2011 to 2016, she was the managing editor, then executive editor of Lucky Peach Magazine. With Lucky Peach, she also edited a cookbook about eggs called All About Eggs. In 2018, she founded The Ruby, a work and event space for women and non-binary writers and artists in San Francisco's Mission District. And we are always happy to be in partnership with The Ruby here at Green Apple. Violet Cooper Smith was born in central Pennsylvania in 1989 and later moved with her family to the Philadelphia suburbs. After graduate, um, sorry, her father is a white American and her mother is from Da Nang, Vietnam. After graduating from Mount Holyoke College in 2011, Violet spent a year teaching English in Tra Vinh, Vietnam and a on a Fulbright fellowship. Between 2013 and 2015, she lived in Dalat and Saigon, Vietnam, and she was the 2015-16 David T. K. Wong Fellow at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. And congratulations on the novel, Violet. Enjoy the show, everyone. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, congratulations on your book, which I was telling you before we began, I really loved. Um, I, I love the book, but I, I feel, I'll confess, a little ill-equipped to describe it. <laughs> so I was wondering if, for folks who haven't read the book yet, if you could give us all a summary. How do you, how do you describe it? Okay, um, I would call it a kind of a multi-stranded narrative. It's uh, set in Vietnam, uh, but over like a 60 year span. And um, it concerns um, a 22 year old Vietnamese American English teacher in Saigon in 2011, um, but also uh, a woman who goes missing in 1986 in a rubber plantation in the Central Highlands. Um, and there's also a school for mixed race children uh, during World War II in a French resort town and a group of uh, Vietnamese uh, ghostbusters performing an exorcism on a haunted house and a group of children in 1993 um, uh, with a, a, a small extortion racket <laughs> in a <laughs> Um, and all of their stories uh, link in different ways over the course of the novel, um, which is about ghosts and shape-shifting and trauma and transformation. Does that sort of sum it up? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. And that's, um, it sounds like a lot, but it's woven together so well. And um, I was wondering, 
just sort of, I guess, if we could start at the beginning, um, which came first for you? Was it like Vietnam as a subject or was it ghosts or were they intertwined? They were always intertwined. V Vietnam and ghosts have always sort of come as a package for me um, from growing up and hearing like my family's ghost stories and my grandmother's in particular, her experiences with the paranormal and just the sort of inescapability of, of ghosts and how they connect to like, refugee histories and coming from Vietnam to America. Um, so I went into the novel off the back of a collection of short stories um, about, about ghosts, um, but primarily set sort of in the US and um, in refugee communities. Um, and so I just, I wanted to just kind of remix a lot of that in the novel, but um, like without the, the kind of parameters of a short story and like, like specific ghost story tropes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just, it was a lot, a lot of fun to write and just kind of see where it took me. Yeah, I, I love your story collection too. And I was wondering if, um, I mean, so many of those stories are also about Vietnamese people and ghosts. And I'm wondering if that was always natural to you to, to write about these subjects, um, just as an American writer living in America. Um, I think it was when I, when I started writing them, it was out of frustration um, because I, I, I couldn't think of a good way of making the material my own. And when I was approaching it, I thought, oh, I'm another, another writer writing like ethnic fiction, which I, I don't know. And I, I brought with it my own sort of insecurities and baggage. Uh, like why, why can't I tell this story? Why do I deserve to, to get to tell these stories? And ghosts were kind of my way into that. Um, and my, 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 my doorway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really loved um, just how the book con combined um, the supernatural with just really mundane things I think about, <laughs> about being in another country. Um, and I was wondering what the process was like for you of making um, the supernatural feel so, I guess, natural <laughs> and, and yeah, just very matter of fact. Well, it's informed by the the matter of factness with which like the people I was talking to when I lived in Vietnam would just talk about their ghost stories and their willingness to approach it with me. Um, and when when I I moved to Dalat in 2013, um, I said, oh, I I don't know how to do research, so I would just kind of go like sit by the the, the lake <laughs> her town and when strangers wanted to come and chat, I would just think, do you have any ghost stories? <laughs> oh yeah, something, something. <laughs> and then it would just build from there and everyone, like the tofu lady would just, would come over and tell her ghost story. Um, and there was something, ghosts are uh, approachable and that um, definitely crept into the collection and Guess the writing style. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if you could describe, I mean, this is just a curiosity I have, but the process of like developing just the plot of this book, and, and it's kind of this like very intricate web, you know, of, of inter lacing stories. Um, and I'm wondering if you started with characters in particular? Maybe Was there a certain character that you started with um, and then it sort of unspooled from there? Or did you have an outline in advance? Um, yeah, what kind of writer are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, I think I'm gonna tell you a, a kind of weird story to explain my writing process. Um, when I was like five or six years old, I had this game that I liked to play when I would go to the grocery store with my dad in like central Pennsylvania. We go to the grocery store and then I would just start to run around 
and try and get lost and like spin in circles and go crazy and then try and find my way back. And that's how I approached writing, <laughs> which is terrible. I think I started in, in the cemetery in 1993. I remember that's the first. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, I threw a lot of things at it to see what would stick. And then once I had made a big old mess of it, I realized that's not a novel. This is a lot of things. But I think if we dig, Violet, we're going to find out how this is all connected. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I kind of like to think of it as a kind of like a crossword puzzle of a book. I think people who like crossword puzzles will like it. People mm-hmm. who get annoyed. I do like crossword puzzles. So you might That's be onto it. something. <laughs> yeah. I did a lot of them while I was struggling with writer's block for this. So that also probably informed the structure of the book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, when did like Winnie come into the picture as, as I, I mean, I, I guess I would call her the main character, even though, yeah, yeah there's so many. Well, she came in later and I thought she was going to be like a third act appearance that just sort of blipped and then faded out mm. um, because I, just, I didn't want to put a half Vietnamese character who had been an English teacher like I was and, and, and have it sort of be, be, be have, my, have my story inter, interfere with hers or have it interpreted that way. But then it became apparent that she, she needed to be the one to guide American readers through this world. Um, and I think she was a very, she felt like a reluctant main character to me. Um, her storyline was the hardest to write. I felt like I was constantly like trying to coax her out <laughs> just because who she is. Yeah, I think it's so, it, it was so interesting to read her story um it felt so central to me to the to the book that she is this mixed race character um especially I think when a lot of I don't know at least for me a lot of this the novels that I've read about Vietnam are from this white gaze um I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um eventually relenting to like include this mixed race character like what did that did that open up something for you did it help unlock um, a piece of this book for you oh absolutely I I think I think I I was my reluctance to 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 have her in it was was from a place of just my own stubbornness um and I thought I was doing it for noble reasons because I said, I wanna show this Vietnam that I know that you don't see in books that's set in like this grubby part of the highlands. That's not about the war. That's not about soldiers. Um, but the, the, the way into it was through Winnie. I think it would have been, I don't, I don't think it would have been as, 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 as big a book without her because she she ended up holding together these other threads that that developed afterwards. Yeah, and I think she's she, like her character voices this very um, I don't know I don't know how to describe it, but like just basic part of the Asian American ex, American experience, you know that um, which is I think to be seen as an outsider in our home um, and yet be immediately recognized as an American when you're in like your quote unquote home country. Um, And I wondered if you could just talk about um, her mixedness in Vietnam and her wanting to be invisible and and believing that invisibility um, is how she'll find belonging. Yeah. Well, that is, I mean, that came from my own experiences uh, moving around in Vietnam and my sort of ambiguously sort of round body. And I would be, if I was with my Vietnamese friends, I would be, I would blend in. And if I was with my obviously foreign friends, I would be foreign. And 
I, I, I wish that I could also just be like an invisible eye sometimes um, mm -hmm. in order to, to, just, to just be without um, constantly either being like, a, like an object of curiosity at best or an object of ridicule um, at worst. Um, and when I, when I started writing about Winnie, I think it, it opened like other things to write about the difference between like full-blooded Vietnamese Americans and then mixed race and, and how there's sort of an even worse kind of like a disappointment if you're, if you're full-blooded like Dao in the book, you speak perfect Vietnamese in America and like your Vietnamese American community, mm -hmm. like a, a model minority essentially. And you go over and you're still not good enough in a way. Mm -hmm. um, when you're mixed and you go over, there's never that kind of expectation to begin with. So it doesn't like sting as much, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, it was um, really interesting to me that you were able to um, really get into just so many complexities of, of Vietnamese identity. Um, and even like among those those mixed race characters who appear in the book, um, just the different sort of like kind of combinations of that, right? And like you know, um, and and sort of the the ranking, the sort of order that people feel um, just because of the way that they look or certain features that they have. Um, yeah, it, it was really interesting to read those those details and specifics. I mean, the, the, the first other mixed race, half, half Vietnamese, half white person that I knew um, when I was little, I didn't actually know that they were half white. I thought they were um, completely Vietnamese. And then I learned later that they had had an awful childhood when they were just like, like tortured for, for having, having a mm. white mother and like had their nose broken. Oh my gosh. Um, it's, I don't know all of this, but I don't know and how the perception of you just changes based on on where you are, and right. um, and and that really broke my heart because I never thought of this person as, as never enough. I always thought they were better than me, and it was and it was a strange awakening to realize that we were exactly as Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. I was wondering if we could talk a little bit just about um, uh, these characters being women. There's a part in the book where um, you talked about the Ghostbusters. They're trying to exercise this very stubborn spirit. And, um, and the fortune teller says that the spirit targets women or it finds women easier to control. Um, and I wondered if you could talk about um, about that aspect. Is that something that's just believed in Vietnam, or is that something that you brought to this story? Um, I just thought it was like so interesting that um, you know women are often expected to be homemakers, and this here it happens very literally <laughs> with ghosts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the ghosts the ghosts really do make make their homes in in these women's bodies. Um, I, I, I was working with a lot of what I hope was a lot of, um, sort of figurative layering that I hope came across um, between sort of how, how women's bodies are just taken advantage of and just and treated as property um, everywhere. Um, and so, yes, they are being possessed in multiple meanings of the word. Um, but uh, in this particular kind of possession, it also um, grants them more power and it, they become, they, they, they have this agency that they didn't have before. And when they are possessed, it's um, in order to find revenge, it's in order to to transform 
um, and to to heal eventually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I found it so interesting that um, the book, um, we do get the perspective of, of Winnie, you know, but throughout the book, we also see and hear a lot from the, the male characters um, who, I mean, I think mostly are terrible people <laughs> and really sexist and racist and all these things. Um, and, and they, and they're the ones who are like dismissing the women characters as crazy or, or not there and, and they're not taking them seriously. Um, so I was wondering, um, if you could talk about that choice to, um, you know, ha describe a lot of these possessions from the point of view of, um, of the, the men who are witnessing them. I think it 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 you need that perspective to to show how bad it actually is. I think you need you needed both sides. I mean, it was it was a little bit horrible to be like like sort of perched in the perspective of some of these um, mm -hmm. male characters. Um, but there was there was almost like a a, a weird kind of like pleasure in getting to to drive that that machine for a while. I mean, it was it was it was like a gross experience to write, but it I it wouldn't it would have felt like it would have felt like just try, like lecturing behind a puppet if we if I didn't have both perspectives. Right. Yeah. And I I thought it was. Um a really brilliant structure. Um, I don't want to like spoil the ending, but just sort of the way that, um, you know, there's this logical sort of masculine objective, almost like scientific side that um, the male characters um, approach things from and a carelessness. Um, they want to like, you know, wrestle with nature and like grow their rubber trees or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there's <laughs> sort of like quiet unseen power that the, the women, um, have that's really underestimated because it's not understood by that other side. Yeah, I mean, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't want it to be like the the. I wanted the the female fury to be at the center of it and to be something. I mean, it's it's not it's not soft. It's like I don't know. It's a muscular anger, and I want yeah. it to be like part of the book too. I wanted it to like to grab you. <laughs> Yeah, um, there's so much, I've mentioned this before, but like just like casual sexism and um, misogyny in the book. And it feels like it's um, a lot of the moments seemed like, there are definitely like some bigger, more dramatic moments in which like terrible things happen <laughs> to, to women. But I, I think there's also um, a lot of, um, description of just the ways in which like in a smaller way you know women are harmed um you know in like just comments or um you know just verbally and how sexism can happen so casually um you know Winnie at one point is told that it's not polite for her to drink coffee um while all these dudes are like getting drunk um so I'm wondering if that was yeah, what was your approach to that? Was that something that was always part of this book too? Just showing like, I think all the aspects of of the way women are treated. Yeah, um, I, when, I, when I came back from living in Vietnam for a number of years, I just, I was so angry. Um, I mean, I, I, lo I loved it. I love I loved Vietnam and I loved my years there, um, but just like you said, the sort the little the little things, the grains of sand that just sort of pile up every day until you're like, oh, it's covering my head. Um, that's what I needed. I needed to write about that. Um, I was just I was so tired of like the everyday groping, the everyday like a, a scary man on a motorbike trying to follow you home. Um, just the the little things like that, and. Uh, and also the the guilt that I felt for knowing that I was I was lucky for for, for the little that I had to actually put up with. Um, so 
So it, it, I needed to, I wanted to, to put it in this book because it does paint a portrait of, of what it's, of what it's like to just be, be a woman moving around in this body and wanting to just, the feeling of wanting to just, to get rid of it or to just find a new one to stuff mm -hmm. your book in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was wondering also about, um, you talked now about like some of that firsthand experience that you had um, in Vietnam and teaching and um, just with crappy dudes. Um, I'm also <laughs> wondering just about, I mean, there are some things that um, that you must have researched, right? Like there's, there's parts of the book that are set um, going, you know, back to 1949. And um, I'm, I'm wondering what your, your process was like of, of researching the parts that you needed to research. And um, yeah, was it text? Was it attending spirit removals? Both. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, a lot of the, the, some of the historical stuff, I was kind. I was kind of reluctant to try the chapter set in like 1942 and um, uh, in the 50s because I don't. I don't know how to do research. <laughs> this isn't why I started doing fiction. I'm lazy. Um, and I, <laughs> I. It's so hard. <laughs> I didn't, school. No. Um, so I. I. Um, and my foray into the historical chapters, um, it began with this book I read about the founding of the city of Dalat um, when it was, uh, when, when the French were there in the colonial era. And they made this city that looked like France so that the French could go and like play France in a, in a cooler climate. And there was this one like little blip of a chapter about a school for mixed race, uh, the Métis children, um, wow. sort of to Frenchify them so that they could eventually join the French army. And I, what, what is this? And that yeah. got the juices flowing. And I thought, uh oh, Violet, I think it's the, I think this is this bit, the, 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 the timeline just got bigger. Um, and then for the other um, sort of, historical notes, I did go to the books. Um, but the more fun research was uh, just um, casual paranormal um, exploration <laughs> in the islands where I would, I would tell my friends, I'm, look, I'm looking for ghosts, I'm looking for ghost stories. And then they'd be like, oh, they're having an exorcism next week. My, co my cousin's house has a poltergeist. Something, something, something. I'm gonna get in. Here comes. Is there room for this American? <laughs> um, and so I did see a kind of an exorcism that kind of inspired the chapter with the Saigon Ghostbusters, where um, there was the, there was um, a second assistanty kind of <laughs> figure. Wow. It was just like a very grouchy assistant with with the shaman who was there like smoking in a corner furiously and like organizing his paperwork and I thought oh I think you're gonna be in my novel too wow <laughs> writers are writers are vultures writers are thieves and so I was kind of pickpocketing ghosts in small ways um, while I was living there what was, did you hear any amazing ghost stories while you were there? Mm, well, the amazing ones. <laughs> what is the most amazing one? They were kind of, they were, like, they were, they were, they were creepy ones, but they were all like uh, just a little bit short and weird. And also I think it was hindered by my not great Vietnamese. <laughs> Um, I don't know the the lake where I would go and chat to people to 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 get their ghost stories was very haunted. Um, the tofu lady did tell me she said, "Oh, at night when the mists come out, there's one. There's a, I forget what ghost it was. There's one ghost that comes and pulls you in. Um, I don't know who she knew who drowned. Um, that 
<laughs> the tofu lady. Yeah. Oh, I love the tofu lady. Yeah, I feel like Vietnam is just so much a, a character too. You know, people always talk about that, like, oh, the setting is also a character. I mean, I think this really um, kind of uh, really, really was that, you know, where Vietnam, I think it was so interesting the way that you you covered so much ground, including like that, you know, colonial history, um, that like ugly colonialism that happened, the and and touched on on the war too. You know, um, was that? How did you did it? I don't know. Did it feel very daunting to be like I'm going to write about Vietnam? <laughs> I mean, well, when I look back at it now, I, I there's there's pair. I'm, the biggest body that is being possessed, that is being used and traumatized and scarred yeah. is the land itself. And and like Vietnam, she she's she's like the vengeful spirit too. Mm -hmm. I I did not have that thought cross my mind while I was like struggling with <laughs> sentences because I don't I don't know. That would have I wouldn't have been able to finish it. I would have gotten like choked up on my own feelings of self-importance but <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah um there's a lot of like visceral stuff in this book i would say um like a lot of blood and urine and there's quite a bit of vomit and there's also like a kind of weird encounter not weird i mean it's pretty gross this in encounter with pigs um that uh, I, and I wondered if you could talk about um, like writing those things. Is it something that just comes naturally to you or were you thinking about like the body and sort of all the ways that it, I don't know, is repulsive and loses control? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm that repulsive. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I was drawn to that in, in like my early writings. I think just for this book itself, um, I wanted it to be rooted in the body and like all of its all of its beautiful grossness, um, and I I think I, I I thought that's that's a way to get like the reader the reader is in here the reader is with me and you can't escape mm -hmm. part of part of the experience. Yeah, it definitely like felt like sort of creepy crawly in that way and, and just yeah very yeah I wanted yeah. that for the horror atmosphere and also um I mean it's about like consumption different kinds of consumption and like I like de devourings and being devoured and so I wanted it like the larger ideas of that to be in conversation with like what was happening in like Sergeant Thun's tummy <laughs> too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. And like, um, yeah, like there's also a lot of food on the other end of that spectrum, right? You know, and um, and that makes a lot of sense to me now that you talk about just um, kind of desire and like what what are the characters in touch with in terms of like their own their own wants and needs and, and, and what the, the women versus the men are, are allowed to want or encouraged to want. Exactly. Oh, yes. I mean, <laughs> how the, 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 the sort of different dynamics with, with food and like how they, it relates to body image and like, I don't know, like the scene with Winnie and Dr. Sang and the mm -hmm. hot, I thought was, I wrote that much, much later, um, mm. even though it's early on in the book. Um, and when I wrote that, I think that that kind of summed up a, a lot of what I wanted the book to be about too. Like, yeah, how your your culture and your perception of self is like represented in <laughs> in this in this soup. And that she was yeah, that was an intense scene. I was like, oh my god, don't do it. <laughs> um. Writing, I think, can be such a thinking project. You know, when I was reading all these really visceral, like bodily um, happenings, I was I was thinking about just you as a as a writer, and um, I feel like while writing, I often just like lose track of my own body and like um, just kind of exist only in my head. 
And I wonder if you could talk about just like balancing. Well, I wonder if writing is more of a visceral process for you or and more of a feeling one. Um, or and and how you like balance those those two two sides. I feel like I write with my stomach or like my my brain is that's <laughs> I don't I think maybe that's also why there's so much like vomiting and queasiness. <laughs> I don't know. I'm also I'm also a cancer. And also you're a cancer. It's just your birthday. Happy birthday. I forgot to tell you. Um no, so I I do, I do like physically feel like if the writing, if something's not working, I'm like, mm, not yet. And then I don't, when it, I, I feel like full <laughs> when I think like I've, this is, this is working. Or I've, I've like rounded up a chapter. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did you feel like you were ever like put under a spell while you were writing this, this book? Like, did you ever feel under the influence of, of ghosts? And if so, could could you tell me when, like what parts? Yeah. I mean, I did think of like a, a, another kind of possession when I was writing. I mean, I am I'm my own version of the like a, a psychic medium trying to to channel this horrible spirit of a story into <laughs> into a novel. Um, and sometimes it felt like I don't know. I just had, I had no control over it. It was the, the book had whims of its own. Um, and I think the most intense um, writing came in the 1949 chapter with the, the, the two Frenchmen um, trying to plant a rubber plantation. I think that was the, I wrote that whole chapter in like eight days which is which is very fast for me because I'm I'm so slow. <laughs> I mean, the whole book took me like six years, and so it was crazy that I hadn't planned for them at all. I didn't know what they were when I started writing it, and like the by the end of the chapter, I don't I don't know where it came from, uh, and it alarms me that the chapter that <laughs> came in the most intense way was the French colonialist. Mm. I, but it just was. Is there a um, like a, a practice that you have or like a routine that you have with writing to sort of, um, I don't know, like call to <laughs> inspiration? <laughs> um, I'm a I'm a night writer. Mm -hmm. I don't I. I wish I could get out of that habit, but I, I haven't been able to. And I do my best work between like 9 p.m. and 1.30 on a good night. But then, then during the day, I'm a vegetable. <laughs> but um, I do like to, when, it, when, I'm, when I'm really stuck, I'm doing crosswords, <laughs> like I said. Um, and at, my, at like the lowest point in the writing of the novel, I thought like the New York Times crossword is like maybe leaving me hints like the spirit of like what of, of words to 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 try and jumpstart something. Yeah. So they are sort of a sacred process to me. <laughs> I think there's something to that, absolutely. Like just feeling stuck and then just like working on something, working on a puzzle, especially, but just having your brain sort of in the background, you know doing something of its own and making its own connections. Yeah, and then maybe you find the right word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a question that's, uh, I don't know, just sort of related to what I'm interested in right now and what I'm sort of going through um, with writing what I'm working on. But um, I'm wondering like, how much did you know of like Vietnam and Vietnamese culture, like growing up in America and how much, like how much did you learn and experience, like know as a child um, growing up and then how much did you like fill in and come to as an adult? Mm. Well, I mean, growing up, I didn't speak Vietnamese very well. Um, my mother's family settled in um, Southeastern Texas after the war and 
we ended up in Pennsylvania by a series of, 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 of weird happenstances. Um, and so uh, I really grew up kind of severed from that, that hub of like the, the really large Vietnamese American community in, um, in Texas. Um, but when, and when I went to, to, to Vietnam to live as an adult, what was odd was I, the, what I was picking up, it, it felt really different than sort of like what my cousins, what my, my Vietnamese American family's experience of being Vietnamese, or like Viet Kiel was because it's like it branched in 1975 and so I was actually learning like different Vietnamese <laughs> than what my what my mom's family spoke and so even though I felt myself becoming like, I think I, I was being more Vietnamese I was much more fluent I didn't feel more Vietnamese American mm -hmm. like, I was still able to relate to like what was going on in like, little Saigon Well, I don't know. And then I, I came back still confused. And so I wrote a novel about it. <laughs> did you worry about like getting things right? Or like, how did you, because there's so many perspectives, you know, like I, I almost think it would be difficult to like, be like, here, read this book, Vietnamese person and tell me if it's okay. You know, like, it's not even <laughs> that, but like, how do you sort of figure that part out? Or I was very worried. I mean, I haven't, I haven't had a Vietnamese policeman read the book. It was published, but I'm sort of least concerned about mm -hmm. <laughs> policemen. I, and I feel like there's this, like, the smallest chance that they will read it, but I did like, show it to my mom and like, like um, Vietnamese American friends who had like lived in Vietnam too. And I wanted to, to make sure that they saw like the Saigon that we knew and experienced together represented on the page in a way that they thought was respectful. I mean, I am worried. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what, what criteria you need to, to write about, about Vietnam. I don't know. I've never been possessed by a ghost, but <laughs> well, I tried it and I, I hope, I hope I did a good enough job. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it is really done with a lot of attention and care and um, sounds like a lot of both research and personal experience too just went into that book. Um, I want to encourage folks in the audience to ask questions if if you have them you can type them into the um, the Q and a which is at the bottom of the of the screen on your zoom um, I can I'll start Let's see what's what's in here. Um, Joe K asks, what research did you do on the repressive atmosphere of Vietnam? The repressive atmosphere? Repressive, yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I didn't. Research. It sounds it sounds like you experienced some just being a woman. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I wrote I what I wrote about I I drew from um, mostly my my year teaching in the Mekong Delta um, and just sort of what it was like being a female teacher there um, as opposed to what um, my male peers experienced. Yeah. Um, we haven't really talked about just like the revenge aspect of this book. I'm wondering if like that was like satisfying for you to write. Um, was it always a revenge story? No, I, I think, well, I think it, it, it might have always been a revenge story, but the, the revenge changed. And, and by the end, it didn't, it didn't feel as good as I thought it would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, it's a, it's complicated. It's um the the ghost the 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 hurt that they're trying to get rid of they they can't get rid of it. You, they can only transform it, and um it comes at a really high cost. I think for the characters who are looking for it. Yeah, I think like that, and also um, that makes me think just that the people 
you know, the, the oftentimes men who are doing the harming um, themselves go through a lot of suffering. You know, I think because of that, um, you know, their birthright or whatever, their, their, <laughs> their, their, their tendency to harm people has also harmed themselves. So I think it's like a real catch-22 of like abuse and like bad things happening to people. Um, Marin asks, what was your favorite part of writing this book? Um, I loved writing the food sequences. There's actually like, I think 15 pages of like, like food, food writing that got left on the cutting room floor that I wrote when I was living in England and I was just, I just missed Vietnamese food so much. <laughs> and, I, and I was just hungry writing. Mm -hmm. Your stomach writing. I was, I can't stop stomach writing. This is um, another question from Joe that is, did you ever think of putting the chapters in chronological order? Mm. I actually, I tried to do it in a lot of different ways that didn't work but before it finally settled into um, sort of being, um, being centered around how far away from the disappearance it was. I tried to do it by um, by by season at first. It it never really worked mm -hmm. in logical order. Um, I don't think anyone would want to jump right in with with the Frenchman in nineteen forty nine. Um, I don't know. It was it was um it was always growing in sort of spirals and looping back in on itself. And so um, I would I tried to to find a form that fit it rather than try to, to make the story fit my form. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was like guiding you through the process of, of knowing whether it was right? I know this is an impossible question because I can <laughs> no. answer this, but I'm just curious if you do have an answer, like how did you know when something's right? Oh, well, trial and error, um, the impeccable judgment of my editor, <laughs> and, then the, and then the stomach. Feels right. That's really good advice and very hard to listen to <laughs> <laughs> at times. Um, can you talk about? Um, I don't know if it's too soon to ask this, but like, what has the reception been so far? Like, is there anything that surprised you about reactions from from people who have read the book or um, have heard you talk about it? Um. I'm I'm ex I'm excited that anyone's reading it at all, <laughs> which is like something I couldn't have imagined when I was like banging my head against the desk trying to figure out what this story was. Um, I think I'm I'm not surprised to come up against, but like a little bit of annoyance at at time jumps, and the lot the non linear narrative, which I understand. Like it is, it is a, sto a story that it asks you to do math which is not a nice thing. Um, but I hope that like the, the, the reader, it's I, the, the title, like build your house around my body. I, can't, I mean, it's, it's a kind of phrase that I think a lot of different characters can say to different things, entities or people. But I also kind of, I need the reader to, to say that to, to the story and to me, the writer. Like mm. I need you to, to let me build it <laughs> and try mm -hmm. come along on this on this journey, mm -hmm. be a bit of counting, and it's going to shake you up a bit. But I hope it'll be worth it. Yeah, that's that's a really good answer. Um, when did you come up with that title? Did you have it from the beginning? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> the very end. I was terrible at titles, um, and I and it really needed a title. It was like the eleventh hour, and I was just like. I, I, I took like an antique typewriter, like very pretentious and like this will, this will loosen it up and I just put words on it. <laughs> and one of the words that came out was the phrase, build your house around my body. And I wow. came from, so that's pretty, maybe that was another example of going 
ghostly possession. <laughs> the possession, I believe. Story that. coming from elsewhere. Yeah, I'm going to count that as the ghost story. Um, do you personally believe in ghosts? Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm, I'm terrified of ghosts. That's why I tried to put them in like my horror novel. Um, and it's, I, I wanted to, I, I, tr I try to treat them with respect, but like my mom and my grandma both see ghosts and like the women in my family have always seen ghosts. And I'm not gonna question that. I don't want the ghost to get me. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen one? I did this one. So like the clearest ghost I saw was not in Vietnam, it was in Pennsylvania. And it was a hazy gray Asian woman <clears throat> in a beret, which is such a weird specific thing that I, 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 I don't know I, if I was making it up, I would have made up something less, less weird because I don't. <laughs> that sounds like, you know, she could be from a lot. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what she was doing in Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> Far when I was seven and I thought, oh, I don't want to ever see a ghost again. So they oh, have. Oh, wow. Seven. They've been, yeah. They've been with me for forever and I can't get rid of them yet. Wow. I think ghosts are probably a good thing for fiction writers. I mean, why not just invite more of them to hang around? Um, the you know the ruby who who's co-presenting this event tonight um so the ruby is this physical space um that um has been around for a while i, I mean the, the physical building it's this old brick building that survived the earthquake in um in san francisco and someone who was there at the ruby late one night said that she saw a ghost there and that it was a woman um, holding a serving tray with like a high necked dress on. She's very specific, um, LM, who saw this ghost. And, and she said, yeah, it just, the woman seemed very polite, was just sort of holding this tray almost like in a hospitality kind of way, you know? Um, and I found, you know, I think a little while later, I found this old photo, um, of the family that had owned the winery um, that the that this building once was, mm -hmm. and um, and I said, are any of these people the ghosts that you saw? Also, still like kind of not believing anything, and mm -hmm. um, and she said, yes, I think it's this one. I think it's this little girl. She was very specific about thinking, believing that the ghost that resides there is this little girl, like all grown up. So. That's our ghost story for <laughs> So do you now believe in ghosts after this? I or mean, mysterious things have happened um, there. So I, I do slightly believe in, and I also definitely believe in um, like inspiration and enchantment when it comes to writing, you know, that feeling of just being mm -hmm. sort of, of just channeling something and not, not being all there as, um, as a thinking rational person, you know, and, and I do really like that feeling. After I finished your book, I sort of looked around and thought, how can I just like invite more of these presences <laughs> into my into my writing morning? Um, and and yeah, I so I'm I'm still looking for ways to do that. <laughs> um, maybe it's it's I don't know doing some some chanting I don't, I don't I have no idea <laughs> <laughs> maybe time to see the fortune teller yeah time to see the fortune. I'm, I'm a little scared though too I'm definitely scared like like you are um we have a question from Kathy Block who asks um or who says first all of the characters are so vivid and filled with flavor did you create a backstory for each of them before you sat down to write the book or did you piece their stories together while writing it was, I mean, it, to, to go back to what you said about channeling the, the spirits while we're writing, it definitely felt like in a way like being a psychic medium and you're trying to get 
a feel of who you're talking to and piecing things together. And um, just like trying to write as quickly as you can um, as you get a sharper image of who they are and they reveal themselves to you. Yeah. Do you do you have a belief about like, um, do you think that the, the best writing for you is the kind that comes like when you're sort of outrunning the rational part of, of you or do you think there's there's both kinds of writing at work? I think I, I need the balance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I, um, <clears throat> the, 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 the natural writing, I, I get carried away with it. And then you need, I, I need the other writer brain that like spends 20 minutes trying to fix three words to mm -hmm. come in and just give like bones to the jelly, <laughs> like a beautiful jelly. <laughs> um, the the <laughs> the writing that just like is flowing out of you too quickly right yeah and now I'm just like imagining like jello filled with bones <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm sorry I'm, I guess I am a, a gross <laughs> writing creature do you feel like I, I think kind of related to this question do you feel that um it's it's the characters for you just like some sense of characters and and um who they are that that propels you forward or do you ever start with like just an image or or like a sentence i think it's it's place for me a lot of times um and and getting into that places like the cemetery or but like cities like dalat that feel like they have a personality and like a soul um, i think that's that's where Plot grows out for me. Mm -hmm. This like lush, lush ground. Can you actually do writing like while you're while you're in a place, or is it something that happens after you're gone from it? Oh, I do need I need some distance in order to make it useful writing. I think I can write I can I can write while I'm there, and I do need to like take a lot of notes and just I don't I like to my journal is mostly just like phrases things that I see in a place, um, but then it needs to be uh, like put through, put through the, the it, there's like the alchemic process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to turn it into something that's actually fiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sort of related to that, do you find that like your fears about writing Winnie um, were, were valid at all like have people been conflating her with you at all or is it so yeah. supernatural that <laughs> no I even saw in a review I think they said violet instead of Winnie oh no <laughs> a Freudian thing um which is I get it and maybe I mean maybe it's almost a compliment I don't I mean it is a story I feel I feel close to it it felt like a like a physical thing and like I was living the story as I, as I wrote it. So I know that I'm not inseparable from it. Mm -hmm. I think it was, it was worth it. It, it will <laughs> have been worth it. <laughs> I hope so, I hope so. Yeah. Um, maybe just to end us for tonight, um, I don't know, do you, can, can you talk about, um, what the the future might be like for you? Are, do you think you're still going to be writing about, or are you still writing about um, the ghosts in Vietnam, um, or are are you thinking about other things right now? I think I don't, the sort of the 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 ending of the book, without giving it away, I feel like what I wanted it to do. Hopefully, it like was kicking open a door, and just like I don't know. Like a, like a big door and I feel like I'm also going out of that and I don't I don't think I'm I'm not going to write about Vietnam just to not do it anymore but um I, I do feel like the ghosts the ghosts are kind of out of my system and they they came out of the door too um so I'm not exactly sure what what direction <laughs> it's going but I'm gonna I'm gonna try and let it guide me rather than because like, even if I even if I set out to write something I'm sure it's gonna 
end up being something that I <laughs> have not planned for. Mm -hmm. Just have to follow your stomach. Always follow your stomach. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for um, writing the book um, and for being here. I don't know if green app is this green apple. Yes. Hey, green apple. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel and Violet, for a nice conversation. Um, to everyone in the audience, you can get your copy of Build Your House Around My Body, both in store and online at greenapplebooks.com. Well, thank you so much for having me and for all the wonderful questions, Rachel. This has been an honor and a pleasure. And thank you also to Penguin Random House. Um, we will see you all next time.